Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview. Today, we have a special guest with us that is uh, Lindsay McAllister. Welcome. Thank you. So we're so glad to have you here. Can you tell us something about yourself and your academic career? Like, what were the choices and what were the reasons behind your choices? I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. And then I decided to attend MIT in Boston, which is an incredible place full of brilliant people working on things that they're so passionate about. And I'm a junior studying computer science there. And I'm planning to, from here to go to law school. Um, I want to work in technology for a little bit. And then my plan is to go to law school and eventually work in technology policy. So my interests are really in connecting technology and a deep understanding of how it works to how it affects society and how it can make a difference for people without hurting them. That's an interesting take on that. I never thought about that, <laughs> that that way, you know? Yeah, that's what I find is even at school where people are doing such impactful work that has such big implications for society, I find that very few people are thinking about what the impacts are. And that's what made me want to go into it. That's great. <laughs> love, to, love to hear. Do you speak any other languages? Ah, claro que sí. Yeah. Um, I speak Spanish. No parlo italiano. <laughs> 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 I've tried to learn a little bit, but I don't really speak any Italian. Um, but I speak fluent Spanish. And I lived in Santiago in Chile for a while. I was working on um, bioinformatics research. And so creating um, computer models of biological systems to predict um, antibiotic production. Okay, so let's get back to like the more technical stuff. How do you keep your technical knowledge and uh, like programming skills up to date, seeing as every day there's new stuff coming out and mm -hmm. everything is updating. How do you, keep, how, do you, how, how, are you how are you being updated with all that? Well, when I'm at school, it's pretty easy because People care so much about computer science that you can't even go two seconds without someone telling you about a new language they learned at breakfast. So being around so many people who are so up to date makes it very easy for me. And also being around so many other classes and workshops. So I definitely try to keep up to date on tech news myself, but it's also, I have a built-in filter just being around people who know what they're talking about. And a lot of student groups um, host workshops and information sessions about using new technologies so that you can get started with. So it helps that you're in a good environment. Yes, very much. What do, do you think about our school? Would you say that we have a good shot at succeeding in the real world, as in getting a job in our profession? It's been very interesting for me to see your school. It's very different. My high school was in a small all-girls school. And we had very little science and or we had science and math courses. We had very little computer science. I had never done computer science at school until college. So I think that the opportunity you guys have to get so much technical instruction like at your age is awesome. And yeah, it seems like a lot of you are quite competent with computer science. And I don't know exactly what the job market for in it's uh, here. Um, in Italy is for computer scientists, but I imagine there's probably a big need and it seems like you guys have learned a wide breadth of skills. Who inspired you to get into computer science? I never expected to be in computer science. No? Uh, not at all. So like I said, it wasn't even a class that I had in high school. Yeah. In high school, I mean, I've never met an academic subject I didn't love. I've always really, really liked school, but I thought Maybe I would study political science or history or maybe math. And so when I decided to go to MIT, that was even a big step for me because that meant I was committing to probably doing something technical. And then when I got there, I had a very hard time deciding between my eight favorite courses of study. <laughs> I tried out so many different things. Um, like the bioinformatics I mentioned earlier yeah. was when I thought I wanted to be a bioengineer. Yeah. I thought for a while I wanted to do physics, also math civil engineering, urban planning. I tried, <laughs> I tried almost everything and I didn't even, and when I first got to MIT at the academic career fair or at the academic fair, there was someone who asked a question to the computer science table and there was a student there answering questions and they said, do you need to already know how to code to do computer science here? Yeah. The guy goes, well, I'm not supposed to say this, but yeah, if you don't know to code, you won't, you won't succeed here. And I was like, wow. 
I guess computer science is out. <laughs> like, guess I can't do that. But I took the classes for fun anyway, because they seemed really cool. And I loved the classes. And so after a while, I changed my major from computational biology to straight computer science. It turned out I caught up just fine and I've loved it. Sure, being smart helped that also. <laughs> so what do you pr prioritize when evaluating a server software and hardware infrastructure? Like what will be your number one thing? Easy to understand. Whoever designs a system needs to make it not just so that it works, great if it works and if it works fast, but if you're the only one who knows how to make it work, you are doing nothing for later generations to iterate and develop on what you've designed. So I think that it's very important that you have good style in all of your software, that you design hardware clearly and intuitively, and that it's something more people can learn from and improve on. That is really important. I mean, if you're not organized enough so that other people can continue your work, it's mm -hmm. basically useless. I mean, so much of computer science comes from people improving on other people's mm -hmm. work, and that's where like what makes the field progress. True. What do you know now about computer science that you didn't know when you started your study? Almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, so in high school, I had done a little bit of self-taught coding. Do you know Khan Academy? No. Well, it's an online site and you can like write your code in a little bubble and then it shows you on the other side. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So it's like that. So I had written, I think the most complicated thing I had ever done was a game of Brick Breaker on KhanAcademy.com. And when I was thinking about how you might actually write code for real, it's like, well, where would you put it? Do you write code in a Word document? And I genuinely thought you must write code in a Word document because <laughs> where else do you put it? <laughs> it took me a while to understand how IDEs work <laughs> and also how to run code out of the terminal. Yeah. I thought the terminal was just the thing where you like write say and then you write something funny mm. and then you play it in the back of class and then like the teacher gets mad and that was all I had ever used terminal for. <laughs> 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 but now you know I can totally grep and awk and all of that. <laughs> so it's important that you got better at it. So uh, how do you approach high pressure situations when everything goes wrong? Can you like give us an example when everything went wrong and then you kind of save the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just staying calm and trusting myself. I think like I just have to have a foundation of trust in my own abilities that I think no matter what happens, I think that I'm capable of rescuing any situation. And so that helps me when I feel like, oh my God, I should panic now. Just think like, huh, like you are better than this. <laughs> like you've done so much worse and you can handle this and it's just like taking a deep breath and acknowledging like I'm smart enough to do this. And when I think about one time that for a final project I had to optimize, I had to write and optimize a processor in Verilog code. So Verilog is what like design, it's like a hardware description language. So we're designing a computer processor in like hardware. This is not my favorite topic. There's not a lot about processors that I enjoy, <laughs> but I had to do this project and I had to get a certain amount of points on it. And your points were um, corresponded to how fast your processor ran. So you just had to do it. And then if it got faster, the more optimized it was, the more points you would get. This is not, not so easy. And so I'm in the basement of this building where this class has office hours. I've been there for like five days continuously now. I think the only time I ate was like when my roommate called me at 2 p.m. like, I know you haven't eaten yet, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And she like would bring me food to the basement where <laughs> me and like the five other people who were trying to do this project were. And I remember like going to the bathroom one time and walking back and being like, I think this is the point where I give up. Like, I've got hardly any time left until the deadline. None of this works. I'm panicking a little bit. I think I just step back and let it go. You know, in my head, I was already composing the speech that I was gonna give myself and to everyone else about why it hadn't worked and how it made sense. And then I kind of got back in there and was like, you're not a quitter. You are not a quitter. And so like, I'm, as I'm getting like minutes to the deadline down and nothing working, I'm like, nothing's gonna like, if I panic, it's only gonna go slower. I just took a deep breath and 
used my brain, wrote it out on some paper, because that's really what helps me understand things, is to write out on paper everything I'm thinking about. And then suddenly it worked. So you saved yourself. That's great. Saved myself, yes. Yeah. <laughs> In these kinds of situations, your work environment matters a lot. Mm -hmm. What would be your like perfect work environment? It depends. If I'm working on something individual, my absolute favorite place is called the Haven Library at MIT. And it's because I love having a lot of natural light. It makes me feel like I'm not just alone in some dark cave. But I also like this library because it's dead silent. My best work style is to be like laser focused um, with no distractions. I'm so easily distracted. Like <laughs> anything sparkly and I'm like, oh, I forgot what I'm doing. Like look over there. Um, so it's good for me to be in a place where there are a few things to distract me. And if I'm around other people, all I want to do is talk to other people. So it's good for me to be somewhere quiet, but then with like a whole bunch of light that I feel like, ooh, it's like a warm glow. Yeah. And I love being outside, so it makes me feel a little like I'm outside. But then if I'm with other people, still the natural light, but it can be nice to also do group work in somewhere with a lot of whiteboards. That, so that kind of helps you like focus on your work. And then, I mean, that could help a, probably a lot of people that get distracted while working and yeah. then they don't finish their, their I project. know some people are able to watch TV while they do work or, you know, sit around other people, do something else in the background. I can't have my phone out when I'm working. Like, I hide my phone from myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gotta play some games with myself. Occasionally, I can't find it afterwards because I like, forget where I put it. I've had to like play the sound, like the find my iPhone, ping my iPhone, play the really loud sound so I can find it. <laughs> That'll be all for today. We would like to thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.